Chris is going to uh, tell us all about his layout and answer lots of questions. Um, Tony Gear is down in the bottom left-hand corner of my street. Tony's my co-host, so if I if I dry up, he, he'll carry on and ask some more questions or or keep, yes. keep track. We're Hello. looking at the numbers who are visiting, and we're also using the track facility if you want to. Um, so you can uh, you can put a, a question up on the chat facility, or with a small group, we'll just keep talking and unmute and keep talking. It depends how many people join us. Chris, thank you very much for uh, your video of your layout. It's absolutely intriguing. Um, has anybody got a question they'd like to kick off with for Chris? Stun silence. Now it's going to be a yes, short yes, session. Yes, this I have. I've got questions, um, and uh, what was my first one? Um, yes, um, uh, you're obviously using quite sharp curves on your, your layout. Do you have any problems with buffer locking, and, and how do you uh, avoid that? Uh, yes, I do. In fact, I think in the video I said it got down to 4.4 foot 6. I, I think actually one of them is, is pretty close to 4 foot radius. Uh, and there is a bit of bus buffer locking on that section. Um, difficult to know what to do about it. The, 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 the one loco, the one train that goes through that is the um, the push pull, and what I've done is there. I've, I've actually mounted the. Um, the there's only one coach on that, um, so the, the coupling between the coach and the tender is is a bar that keeps the the buffers sufficiently far apart, so there's no buffer locking. Otherwise, yes, it would be a problem. Even on uh, on on wagons and things as I run through. It, it can be tricky unless you're very careful with it. Take it very slowly and it, it seems to be quite happy, but um, increase the speed and uh, chaos reigns, I'm afraid. So I, I, can't, I can't find an easy way of overcoming it. I know there was something in the, ga in the, uh, the, the, the Gazette about Buffalo, but, but that was all talking about preparing the bend and all the rest of it. Well, it's too late for me now. I've laid it all down and so I'm stuck with it, I'm afraid. Yeah, I, suppose, I sort of guess there's a route as well by reducing the amount of slop in some of the wagon axle boxes and things like that and making sure there's not too much side play in any of the vehicles because obviously that can play into it as well, can't it, I guess? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose it can. Yes, it can. Yeah. Um, now then, there's a question. Is, is, there a, is there a bonus on the coaches of putting the coupling actually on the, on the bogey rather than on the body of the coach? Hmm. That would be an interesting experimentation, I think, to try yeah. and see that. I think I think that would make a difference. I've got most of my couplings, which are KD autos, on the underframe of the coaches. Uh -huh. But um, I, I built a loco, and on one end of the loco, it's a, a Bobo, uh, sorry, a Coco electric loco. On one end, I put the coupling on the body, but on the other end, I put it on the bogey. Oh, right. And the bogey mounted coupling is definitely better for coupling on curves, and probably will reduce your buffer lock as well I should think. Mm. I, I've only got six foot radius curves as the minimum so I, I haven't got the smaller radius that you've got. You're very lucky. <laughs> but, uh, putting the um, coupler on the um, on the bogey was an experiment to start with and I think I'll use it again in future. Because you would think putting it on the on the bogey then the, the, the buffers would tend to swing further out but, but that's not what you found. Well I think the coupling is more consistent in relation to the centre of the bogey then. Ah oh, yes, yes. Certainly I worth the worked out the, I haven't worked out the geometry, it's only at the experimental stage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be more in line it'll be more in line with the track, won't it, if it's on the bogey than on the on the body of the vehicle. So yes, yeah, good call. Yes, if they're both are, of course, if the loco and whatever whatever you're pulling along, uh, you should have no problem, should you? Hmm. Yeah, mm, we'll see. Chris, can you tell me how long have you been building this railway? Um, I retired about five, nearly six years ago now, um, and that's why I started building it. Prior to that, I'd been, um, I make videos of one sort or another, and uh, I made a series of uh, DVDs for model railway enthusiasts called the Right Track series, and, and that took me all over the place doing videos about kit building, um, scenery, DCC, all sorts of things. We produced 20, 20 discs in the series. So that, I mean, I had been interested in model railways before that, since being a lab, um, but that sort of uh, focused the mind more. So by the time I'd finished making all those, um, 
And I thought, well, actually, what am I going to do with this, this retirement? I know I'll build my own layout. And, and it, it, I suppose I should have gone double O, but but really, I, I do like these the old age size, the feel of the things so much better and you can put more detail into it. Mm, mm. So it had to be O gauge. I just have got a fairly small room to put it in. Uh, yeah, that's the right thing. Was that, were those the videos one which featured Tony with his, Tony Wright with his exploding can of paint? Oh, that's the one, yes. That, you, yes. you saw that one. <laughs> 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 there was another one. That, there was another one didn't actually make it um, into production, but it was one we started doing one on building O-gauge kits, um, but it never got finished. But on on there, he's fitting all the um, all the valve gear, and he's trying to get it solder it all up so it doesn't it doesn't go solid. Uh, and at one stage, he flipped something way off out of the way uh, and completely lost it. Um, but we did find it and continue on from the, the nice thing about Tony is that he can, it, it's a warts and all job. If he makes a pig's ear or something, he'll, he'll, he'll carry on from there on the basis that somebody who's done what he's done needs to know how to get back from where he was to, to actually start finishing the model. So, um, yes, it was great fun with Tony. We, we produced well, quite a lot with Tony and then, um, because he's essentially a, a kit builder. Uh, and from there, all went into, into painting and lining and scenery and stuff. And then we used Tony as, an, as, as, a, as a presenter to introduce the other person and ask, and ask questions. Yeah, because he's good at narrating, isn't it? And um, talking, yeah. uh, he's good at that. He's yeah. really good at that. One thing he doesn't like is DCC. He's not, he's a bit like you, Richard. He's, he's an analog man. And we, we did... <laughs> We did this thing on DCC and we got somebody in and they had this long conversation about it. Uh, and you could see that Tony was asking the right questions, but he really wasn't convinced at all. <laughs> <It's just laughs> right thing to do. Still, there we go. That was a long time ago. We, uh, yeah, the last one went out in 2015 and then we, uh, we closed it all up. A good, a very useful series of uh, videos, even if no matter what scale you're modelling, a uh, very useful series, series of videos. Well, yes, that, that's, well, I, I suppose. I still watch, I've got uh, got files of them here, um, and now and then I watch the odd one just for a bit of an idea on how to do things. It's, it's really quite a useful thing to have. May, may I ask what decoders you use in your, your, your engine? Uh, the ESU, uh, version 4 decoders, on, uh, in pretty well everything. Uh, there's a couple of them I'm not sure what I've got in because they're, they're locos that I've got from other people, but uh, certainly the ESU ones are, are the ones I've used. They've all got sound on. Uh, luckily, I bought them before they got over £100 um, because that is, like we were saying earlier, it, it's, that's a bit of a downside to, to converting something to DCC because it's, it's hugely expensive. If you've got you know, 10 locos, 100 and odd quid a piece, it, it's a lot of money. Mm, mm, mm. Any decoder failures and any problems? Uh, I've blown a couple up, um, but I wouldn't put that down as a failure. But the nice thing is that you can return it to the manu, or you could return it at that time. I don't know if you still can uh, return it to the manufacturer, and they'll give you a replacement. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm muscling in a bit here, but yeah, I I, um, I, I, I don't use the SUs because I don't like them. I don't know why, but I never got on with them, so I always use Zemos. Right. And the same thing, actually. If you have a problem with one, you can say, I, I use Digitrains, and I send them back for 15 quid and with a sort of burnt, burnt hole in the middle of it, and they'll send me out a new one. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, well, you know, it's an expensive decoder. That's not bad, I think. That's, 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 a, that's a good service. Um, yeah. The reason I think I use ESUs... Well, the reason I know I use ESUs is because the first one I bought was an ESU. I then got into JMRI and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and I used JMRI to, to set all the decoders up. And having got used to doing that, um, I suppose I'm nervous about trying another decoder, which might have completely different setups. So it's, it's a case of once you've started with something that you like and you know, um, then you just stick with the same thing. But I suspect so, if I started with Zemos, I'd have been, I'd been a Zemo man. Yeah. So when you say use the JMRI, is that um, a specific bespoke programmer or the um, Sprog2, Sprog program? Or? No, I, I, I use a, an NCE um, controller and uh, I've got a couple of controllers. I've got a small cab, which is that one there, 
um, and, and the usual large one. The nice thing about that I found is that I started with the, the bigger controller as a, as a basic unit. Um, and then you can expand on from there. So I can still use it on the, on the bigger five amp system I've got here. Um, JMRI is, now I see how the problem is, my brain's gone. So let me just see, um, what are they called, JMRI? Somebody so it's a lot of the pro cab thing uh, that you get on uh, yeah, uh, yeah. through the computer. I'm just having a look for it. Well, I had it a minute ago. It's in here somewhere. It's gone. But basically, you get the the, uh, the first one, which is there's a base unit. One of them's called power cab. The other one's pro cab. I think pro cab is the the bigger one. I might be wrong. So let's say it's power cab is the the the, the cheaper unit, it's about 150 quid, I think, when I bought it, um, which gives you one hand unit, which is quite a big one. Um, and then you can expand on that. The, the unit then becomes, when you put it into a bigger system, it just becomes a, a, a secondary unit like that. So you can you can add, instead of having to buy a new system when you want to upgrade, you, you simply buy a new controller, uh, a more powerful um driver for the system yeah. and then uh, and then you're home and dry you can use all the existing stuff that you built up on the last time yeah, so, so, so what, what make was that uh nce oh the nce system NCE. right yeah the same yeah. as i used yeah NCE. oh is it right okay yeah but did you say what did you say you moved now move on to well i've used the nce system for for controlling the layout uh -huh. but um for, for for program the locos i use a sprog 2 which is a free program you download and then you can buy the Sprog 2 unit, which plugs into one of the ports on the computer. And you attach that to the loco, and you can actually then um, program individual um, settings on the decoder. And in fact, it, it comes in quite, it, it will interrogate the decoder and come back with quite a nice display. And it'll have, for instance, the sound settings, the acceleration, and it's all nicely displayed for you in, in different categories without having to actually know what each um each cv is and mess about yeah that's the word i'm looking for each cv number is set to it, it's done in a nice little display and um it tells you in in common language what each thing is doing and what the setting is cool, so right. that's quite useful um, i hope you're taking all this in <laughs> <laughs> it's all good stuff really richard it's, it's fun i'm just loading up the thing i've got um just the, 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 the Sprog 2 is not very expensive. It's just this this um, this unit that, that plugs into the in, into the, the port, and then you just have a couple of clips. Has a power supply, and it just clips onto your wheels. You put the loco on the bench, just oh, clip it on, yeah. and you can interrogate the loco, and you can load up all the the settings on onto the computer. And then you you have a table with all your locos in, what the numbers are, what the CV settings are, and that 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 all stays on the computer. So you've got a record of everything. All right. So I wonder, I, and it, it sounds very similar to what I've got. Um, yeah. Let's see now then. Can I can I share, Richard? Yes, of course you can. Yeah, you can oh, share okay. screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, I share this. Can you see what I've got there? This um, this is Decoder Pro. That's the name I was trying to think of. Yeah, that, that, uh, yeah, that's 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 the same one that works with the Sprog Two. Yeah. Oh, is it? Same. Ah, right. Yeah. Oh, this um, through the uh, NCE system. There's a, there's a USB interface that that goes between the the DCC the NCE system and the computer. Uh, so it's just a little unit, costs a couple of quid or something, um, just a converter. But that's what I've got on mine. I'll just put it full screen so I can see it myself. Well, it doesn't make a difference. Um, but those are all my locos with little pictures of them, very pretty. But yes, all the various uh, decoders. Um, I oh, see they're not all um, the SUs, are they? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. Yeah, I, I can see you've got a Zim. I can see you've got a Zimo there. there is, <laughs> the yeah. Six, four, five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, the 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 Zimo came from um, a, a friend of mine, John Bryce, who's sadly with us no more. Um, but he had he, he he did what you're you're planning on doing, Richard. He had a huge garage that was about. 40 or 50 feet long mm. and 10 or 12 feet wide. And he had this big U-shaped layout running down it. Um, 
and it was my challenge to convert him from DC to DCC. <laughs> uh, I, I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <talking> <laughs> and it worked. It, it, it worked a treat, actually. Luckily, we got it all going nicely um, before he, uh, he moved, shook off his, his, um, his, his human coil. So, um, but that, that was a great success. Uh, we did make a bit of a video about it somewhere. Um, but that, that works extremely well. And yes, that, that one came from John. So at a very good, reliable decoder it is, you know, I, I think they're all pretty good. Um, I couldn't even, t the DH163s, I'm not even sure who those are, those decoders. Are they, are they the ones that come with ready to run coaches? Um, no, no, I no. bought them. I oh bought no, they're, them. they're an easy build, aren't they? So, hmm. Yes, uh, yes, yes they are. But what, what you can do on this, just, just to quickly run on, um, if I go into edit only, if I select a loco, let's select the, not anything, there's a delta there that I modified. Um, you see, I'm going to show you the ESU settings because I understand them. There's no way I'd go <laughs> and look at the, uh, the Zemo settings because they're frightening. Here we go. So, have you seen that change? I can't see what you're seeing. Yeah, we're still on the same page. It's on the same page. In that case, I wonder if I can change my share. The radio so, button's still showing programming track at the moment. The radio button's still oh, showing programming yeah. track, yeah. Oh, right. It didn't, go to edit. It didn't go to edit only. Uh, ah, and I've come off screen, off sharing now, haven't I? So let's see. Uh, see if I can share that. How's that? Yeah, exactly. This, this is this is exactly the same screen as yeah I'm using. On so the so yeah. you're yes, yeah, so you're using GMR, so you're doing it through yeah. the through the Sprog. So yeah. uh, and this is for, for people who haven't used it. This is brilliant because you can set anything up on the basics. There we go. You can change the address. Um, you can even and, and here's a convenient thing: change the direction the thing goes in. So if you wired it all up wrong, it goes in the wrong direction. So <laughs> forward is reverse. You just change it on there. Um, there's motor settings, you can alter acceleration and deceleration. But CVs don't get a mention any on this, it's great. Uh, you get a, a speed table so you can actually set the shape of the, the acceleration as you turn the thing up. And all sorts of things, function mapping and stuff. So it's, it's really quite, uh, quite fun and, and fairly straightforward to do once you've got used to it. So that's... That's DCC. Chris, one of the things that struck me about the layout was the amount of lighting you put into it. It's <laughs> phenomenal and you looks brilliant and actually sets, sets the whole scene properly. Well, it does make a big difference. I haven't got shares in an LED company, but perhaps I should have. <laughs> um, I, yeah, very briefly, my background was an electronics engineer. Uh, and uh, started with TVs and fixing radios in back streets and things. Um, and so I've always had interest in the electronics. Um, fitting lights in things is, is something I, I, I think makes a huge difference, uh, even into things that um, don't normally have them. Um, there's the, there's a, a standard class five that you probably saw on the video. Um, and there's a light in the cab in that. Now, they never had a light in the cab, but because I was so pleased with the detail I'd managed to squeeze into that cab. I thought, sod it, I'll put a light in there so I can see it as it goes past. <laughs> um, so, but again, it, it just, a, just using one of the outputs of the DCC decoder. Um, there's also the houses. I don't know if you can see them particularly well on this shot. Let's see if you got it. I've got another camera here. So is he living dangerously? Um, there we go. And that's not showing anything other than the, almost the same shots as you got from. Now then, bear with me just a moment. Switch on the other half of the layout because I need to flash me lights. There's some houses up here, which you should be able to see in a minute. Um, if I lift this up, you can see, I, you probably remember I said that I got into 3D printing because I put lights in these buildings and the rooms were empty. Well, um, the lights in those houses, those all happen to be on at the moment, apart from one room, and the ones next door are, are, are dim. But in fact, um, 
as you watch the layout, and it probably won't happen now because I'm sure Sod's law applies. Um, but this is on a pad, this thing, so I just need to sort of kick it until it's almost straight. Um, but the lights on there actually change as time goes on. So I've got them set. Uh, there's a bit of electronics that I've got, uh, mainly from Merg. I'm a member of Merg. Um, and each house has its own set of uh, light control. So as time goes on, when, you, when you're moving trains about, suddenly something will catch your eye. And there's a, one, one room's gone out or another one's come on. And the idea is just to, just to make it look as if somebody's actually living in the house and they're moving from room to room. Very clever. Mm. So, and is that controlled by the, um, the, the C bus, did you say? C um, bus controls all the everything other than the, what's running on the tracks uh, is controlled by C bus. Apart from a couple of things that, that Arduino control, but mostly it's C bus. All the C bus is doing to that row of houses is just giving it a twelve volt supply, and then the um, the other circuits are um, controlling natural lights. I can actually, if I take the roof off these, I can show you, can't I? Each, say each pair of houses. Um, so there's a pair, there's the printed circuit board doing the switching. Um, and then the signals go out down to various LEDs. Um, that is just a, a voltage control thing. But then we've got the same arrangement on the next roof there. And I, I've got more buildings planned for going further on. We'll, well, we'll do the same thing. But there are, that, those circuits only need 12 volts from the C bus uh, to work. So they're all right. So, 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 so you don't need a separate supply, it all comes from the C bus. Yeah, and, and what I've done is um, I'll just move that camera because that's really not very straight. Yeah, we're that's feeling dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, yeah. C bus is, is all well and good because you've got four bits of wire, four wires, you've got 12 volts running down to feed all the various um, nodes, as they call them, and then two lines of data. But what I'm doing is I'm drawing a fair bit of current from that 12 volt supply. So I've actually run in parallel with the C bus, another uh, good thick pair of wires with the 12 volts on. It's the same 12 volts, and it, it, I run it almost like I do the layout. You know, I have, I have droppers um, coming down from the track to the supply. Well, what I do is I have, not droppers, but leads going from this beefy 12 volt supply actually to feed the, um, the nodes in each case. But that means that I've got across the length of the layout, um, I've got 12 volts all the way along it because there's virtually no voltage drop down those thick wires. So it's 12 volts I can use for all sorts of applications. Mm. And that's, that's really quite handy to have. Mm. They're very impressive. Um, and do you, do, you, do you dim them at night time or do you just have them all at the same bright? Oh, they're either on or off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, they're, they're all um, individually controlled, actually. Again, one of the nice things about CBUS is that you can actually control each light individually. Mm -hmm. um, so that the wiring is quite straightforward. Out of each, uh, each of these nodes, and I'm looking for one to show you, um, I presume there's a kit you get from Merg to make each of the nodes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. If yeah. I remove this signal box. It's you might as well extend it and control the rest of your house. Well, <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> um, let's go to this wobbly camera again. Right. In there... Um, that's one of the nodes, and that's normally hidden by the signal box. That's feeding all sorts of lights all over the place. It's feeding the signal box, but it's feeding uh, yard lamps. Um, there's three yard lamps it's feeding. It's feeding uh, other buildings. This little um, shed here, this little converted wagon. Uh, so there's all sorts of things it's, it's feeding. Uh, How many... There's eight. 
How many? Oh, eight channels. channels. Eight, yeah. eight channels for each one. Um, yeah. Now you can get it depends on the decode. The, the, sorry, you to keep calling them nodes. Depends on the, the thing that you get. But you can actually get sixteen now. Then you could make them either inputs or outputs. So it, it can be quite. Um, it, it's quite a versatile little thing. There aren't that many of those on the layout really. Uh, probably let's see. Ooh. Eight, maybe eight, no more than eight, I don't think. Six to eight. So not a lot because there's lots of outputs on them. Um, you could also feed um, solenoids, uh, sorry, servos from there. Um, and so you can, there's, there's another one down here near where I'm sitting, um, which drives the uh, analog, sorry, use wrong analog, sorry, uh, semaphore signal, um, which is just over there. And there's another one on the other side. I've got more signaling to put on yet, but it's taken me five years so far. Heaven knows when I'm going to get this done. Are they going to be? Are they going to be worked through your track circuits or not? I'm going for the easy option, Richard. I'm going to have simply linked into through CBUS to the to the points. So if a point frees up a, a a feed, then that same point movement will also feed the, will also drive the semaphore signal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's a cop out, I know. And I, I have a mate that uses CBUS. He's got a double O layout. It's bigger area than this, and it's magnificent. He's a complete wizard with it. Uh, I have no idea what he's doing, but he has it all uh, interlocked and interreacting. And he's setting up routes and things and doing all sorts of wonderful things with it. And all his signals. Uh, although they're not semaphores, they're, they're light signals. They come on and off at the right times, and he can right mm -hmm. do all sorts. He can send a rogue train round, and the whole system compensates for the rogue train. Oh, it's amazing! There's absolutely no way I would get into all of that because it's. I like playing with my trains too much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things I did was was I decided very early on was I've got signals for all the seaweed side of the railway, fifty foot long, and what I decided to do was not link them to the track because right. if you get friends to visit and, and operate and have a good afternoon what they don't want to be doing is what have i done wrong that the train's not going because i haven't pulled the right signal yeah. or, or yeah. you know and it, it gets complicated so just if you run through a red signal it's not the end of the world because you're, you're operating a model railway and you can see what you've done wrong but it's uh, if it, it can be over complicated it by having them all interlinked People like them, but uh, for me, it doesn't help if you've got novices coming to play with your railway, you know, and, the, and you need two or three people to to have a, a fun afternoon rather than have an afternoon where you're brainstorming on what have I done wrong this time. Yeah, <laughs> quite right. Yeah, it, 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 you've got to make it, you can't do everything. Um, I don't think so. And, and you're in danger of making it so wrong and complicated, it, it doesn't become fun anymore. Yeah. It, it becomes yeah. hard work. Do you upgrade uh, to a schedule then? Oh gosh, no, no, I just sort of drag a train out and run it I'm running, yeah. and shunt things up and down. And I don't actually, if I'm really honest, I don't often use it. I, I don't often play trains because I spend all my time building stuff, developing stuff to, to put on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's only when somebody comes to visit and says, as they rarely do, says, can I come and play with your trains? They're more likely to say, you do what? But... <laughs> Um, but but those who are interested when they come around, I, I, I get all these locos out and get it all running. I think actually this is quite nice, and uh, and I run a few trains before I put it all away again. But most of the time it's taken. Um, at the moment, the, the project is to get this turntable working, which I think I almost showed you a minute ago. We we'll just pull this dodgy camera around again um, and go on to that. It's probably all over the place now. There we go. Now that that turntable, it's only got one in, and that's it. So it's there purely for for turning trains around. Mm. Um, but it, it's it's DC driven. It's got a DC motor and it's belt drive. Um, but I wanted some way of making it stop in the right place. Um, yeah. And, and what I've managed to do, in fact, I think I mentioned it in the little write-up I did for the video. Um, what I've managed to do is use, um, I don't know if you've come across a thing called an Arduino, which is a little computer on a board. 
um, and this Arduino now um, monitors the position because just, you can't see it, but just in here, um, just under the trap before you get to the, the point of correct stopping, uh, there's a sensor. Um, so when the, the bridge turns round and gets to that sensor, the little computer then starts to count, it counts in uh, milliseconds, and I think it's about 30, 30,928 milliseconds later, <laughs> it stops there, um, which is almost the right spot. And I've also um, got under that track, there's a, a rod that comes out, a key that locks into a, a, li a little um, lock thing that I've, 3D printed that fits under the under the bridge. So it then, even if it isn't spot on, it's nearest time it right, and that will pull it right into position. So that's that's my challenge at the moment, um, and it does almost work, which is quite encouraging, really. <laughs> what um, what point motors do you use? Um, they're um, tortoise motors. Yeah. Oh, they're low current, aren't they? So presume that's you can run those that run those from the C bus. Uh, yes, that's right. It's all yes, it's all C bus driven. Although um, to change polarity to the motor, I use relays to switch the polarity. Right. Um, I, I say they're all tortoise motors. One of them, uh, which wasn't a tortoise motor, it was another make, um, failed, and so I put a servo in there, and that works fine. But again, you can drive that with C bus as well. Yeah. yeah. Chris, it's um, quarter to. Oh gosh, really? End of time already. I'm oh gosh. It very quickly, we're really enjoying it. It's been very informative. <laughs> well, I've um, enjoyed myself. I don't know. It's probably else nobody else has brought out of the tree, but I've enjoyed it. So thank you very much for that. That's a pleasure. Can I thank all those who come along and uh, listen to us? And Chris, thank you very much for presenting it. It's a wonderful way out and congratulations. Thanks very much thank indeed. You. And if I can help anybody, just uh, give us a shout through the Guild. Will do. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, thank Take you, care. everybody. Bye bye now. Bye. Bye now. Bye.